Talking financial organization and a professional practice does not have to be boring. Are you ready for a few money in, money out ideas? It's Susan Gunn coming directly to your head to make you think. Can you handle the truth? Because she is known for being energetic, laughs a lot, and gives honest, sometimes direct, but always practical advice. It's time now for Money In, Money Out. I am so excited to have my special guest join me at the table today. You guys are going to love this episode. A couple of months ago, I joined some of my high school classmates in an alumni gathering. Arlington High School has changed a little bit since I graduated, but the tightness of the community is still the same. During the gathering program, the principal, Stacy Humble, spoke. I will admit that most of the time when I attend meetings like this, it's a little difficult to dredge through the monotonous delivery of the speaker. Not so that day. Not so at all. I felt a automatic kinship to Stacy. Someone who has a message they are passionate about and a group they are passionate about helping. We are in completely different industries, but the passion runs deep all the same. I took notes. Yes, you heard that right. And then I finally wrote, podcast? With a question mark. The more I continued to listen to Stacy, the more I needed to have her on this podcast. So she's here. <laughs> she began as a teacher with a bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa. Iowa. Iowa? Then she received her master's degree. Okay, this is a little bit better. From UT Arlington. <laughs> That's right down the street from where she is now. She has a broad spectrum of experience teaching English, coaching volleyball. Some of my friends uh, will love the coaching volleyball part. To assistant principal at an elementary school. Oh my gosh. To a principal at a junior high. Good grief. To the principal of my beloved alma mater. Arlington High School. And not only that, she has two kiddos of her own. I think all that experience has provided her a wealth of wisdom that I am excited for her to share with our audience. Stacy, welcome to Money In, Money Out. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I am, I am so excited because, oh my gosh, though you are in education, there were so many things that you said that day that apply to business. I mean, everybody is having a problem getting good hires. One of the reasons, one, one of the reasons that I was compelled to have you on my podcast was because of all that information that you gave, specifically about the shortfall of teachers and the retention of the teachers once you've hired them. This is a worldwide issue affecting every known industry. Healthcare is no exception, and that's the industry that I work in. But I never realized to the degree that you were talking about with teachers. I've heard about it, as everybody has. Everyone is affected by a labor shortage, competing, especially for great team members. You know, like, how do you keep them at Arlington High and they don't go down the road to Sam? I mean, those kinds of things are just always very general to and apply to everybody. So we're going to go back. Let's go back a little bit to pre-COVID and talk about the State of the Union then, and then you bring it forward for me. Sure. Well, first, I really do. I like the parallel between healthcare and education. I think that there are a lot of similarities with, with our systems. And what really connected us, I think, especially during COVID, is that we, we deal with the real people all the time. And so it's our job to work with real people and children and adults and to help them at it. And the uniqueness of COVID was that we kind of all were going through it together. And, and I'll get into that too. But prior to COVID, I think, you know, education was, was kind of always grappling with, with whatever new initiative was coming our way. And as educators were used to transitioning or adjusting and there was kind of this moment before COVID, I think we all came to the realization, and it's an important one, that we are the answer. And I, I truly believe that. And I, I say that often, that, you know, we're, we're the ones that give food to students who need food. We, we clothe them. We educate them as well and get them to graduate. But if you need resources for anything, the answer is always the school. 
And there was an, a time when, you know, people felt that weight and almost said like, this isn't fair. You know, there's other entities for that. That's for the police. That's for the homeless shelter. That's for the church. That's for this group. And we come to the understanding of, no, it's us. And, and we do, we take that on. So, well, and, and, and yeah. to that point, I think the reason that you take it on is because you guys are the ones that first learn about the needs. Yeah. I mean, you see them in raw need, necessity. You know the kids that don't have a place to live. You know the kids that don't get meals. It's true. And we, they're here with us every day. And we see not only their needs, we see how they don't even know what to do when they have those needs. This idea that, oh, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. And if you don't, if you can't afford it, there's this clinic here for you. People don't even know that those things exist. And we do. And not because we were trained on it or anyone gave us any training on it, but because just when you see those people each day, you learn it. And, and then it's our work to just learn what people are going through mm -hmm. and then be the answer to it. And so that's what we were prior to COVID on a much smaller scale. So then when <laughs> COVID came and it was time for schools to shut down and time for us all to figure out what to do in a pandemic that you know, no one knew the answer to. Everybody came to us. Well, you guys always have the answer. So what is this? What's going on? What should we do? And we took that on to try to figure out what we should do. But at the same time, we also had no idea what this pandemic was. So there was a big weight on the education system to be an answer to something that we did not know the answer to. And we, we usually don't necessarily know all the answers, but we would know what experts to go to. Oh, I've got a student that, you know, a big thing like is suicidal. I, I might not have perfect expertise on suicide ideations, but I've got experts all around. And so we're used to that, to that collaboration with, with experts in the field. And in this case, we, we did that. We got with Tarrant County Health Department and the CDC and various entities that were as much of an expert as you could be and developed, you know, the system around it. But people were watching that live. And I think what was really hard about that was people also had their own opinions on it based upon not working with experts, maybe, or, or whatever they felt. And so we were challenged a lot with, with whatever direction we went. And, and that took a lot out of, out of folks who were just trying to help everyone through this as best they can while, you know, dealing with, with the outside also going through it. So... At the beginning of last year, you know, we had shut down for a bit and then came the beginning of last year where we knew we had to come back to campus, but part virtual, part not, figuring out exactly what school was going to look like. I knew then that we were going to have a hard time, that teachers were just going to have a hard time. We were already struggling with our own personal health and they were going through sickness themselves. Family members were sick, students were sick, students' parents were sick, and and so this came that August after we had all created virtual learning. We educators created it. It didn't exist. We couldn't call an outside entity. We were creating it. So there was already quite a lot of um, the verge of burnout. I don't now now seeing burnout this year or at the end of last year, I would call what we saw at the beginning of last year the verge of burnout. And I went, just read a book called The One Thing and really thought that it would connect with a lot of staff members. And it just, it connected a lot with me. And a big thing that we talked about last year was what's called counterbalance. So this idea came often at the beginning of last year and even throughout the last year of balance, find balance, balance home, balance life, balance work, balance your kids. And everybody kept telling us to find balance. You know, we were working 20 hour days, online, offline, home visits, and people kept saying, find balance. And we couldn't figure that out. So what the one thing talks about is counterbalance. And so that's what we talked about last year, which is this idea that you're never going to find balance. You know, you think about a balance and one side is up and that means the other side is down. And so when we talk about actually having balance, that means moving them both to the middle. Well, if, if 
both sides of the scale are in the middle, you're actually at half of both. So, so by definition, when you have balance of work and life, you're doing both at 50%, which makes you feel like a failure. So the idea of counterbalance is, all right, put one at 100 and one might be at zero. You're going to focus on your work. We know you're going to work long days. You're going to be here for 15 hours a day during, if I'm a coach, the playoffs. And I might not be home a whole lot during the playoffs. But my house knows that. And I can do that. And I can feel successful getting ready for the playoffs while my house kind of needs to know you're going to, we're going to eat McDonald's every day for a while. And then the, the secret though is get back, counterbalance it. So when the playoffs are over, switch it back, take some days off of work. You're not doing football anymore and go and make sure that you take care of the house, go spend time with your family and your kids and, and go on date nights and all of that. And that resonated a lot with me and it resonated a lot with our staff of, hey, it's okay to, we know you're going to bust it at the end of the six weeks. We know you're, you're going to take it on when it's, you know, your big moment, which is, could be testing. It could be prom. It could be whatever event you take on as an educator and do that and don't feel guilty for it. And then switch back over and let some of us take care of you. We'll take care of the school while you take care of your home. And by swinging back and forth, when those times come along, it really would help our staff and, and all educators and probably anyone in any profession to just really feel, feel like they're doing better at both work and life. Yes. And that builds a community, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. So, so we worked through that last year quite a bit. I had to send out some reminders of swinging back, make sure you swing back to the other side. Don't, don't stay. That's, that was the big takeaway from the book is you can't stay on one side. If you stay too long, that's where you, you know, you kind of start to feel like a failure or like you're not doing, doing everything you need to do. But it got us through last year. I I think though, we just couldn't have expected last year to be what it was. So, you know, coming back, I think it was, we had four weeks that we were virtual still in August, September. And then TEA said, you know, you have to offer in person. And so we had to figure out how to do that with CDC regulations, which was six feet apart and knowing where every kid is at every time. So we could, you know, go back and check and see if somebody was to get COVID to be able to contact trace and the logistics of it in a school were really hard. Additionally, it was at a time when we couldn't get sanitizer. We couldn't get cleaning spray. We couldn't get paper towels. I mean, you name it, we were going all virtual. There was a shortage of technology. We couldn't even get extension cords to charge devices throughout the day. So just the logistics of, of what it would take to abide by those regulations, I don't think people had ever thought of. There was a board meeting I remember watching, I think it was a Thursday night board meeting, and they were discussing, uh, we were talking about coming back to school, when we would come back to school. And I know there was some folks in the community that wanted us to come back to school like the very following Monday. And whether or not we were, you know, for or against it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't even that. It was just about, in my mind, I thought, okay, so if we come back on Monday, I don't have extension cords yet. I don't have my hallways set up to be one-way halls. I don't have numbers. We would have to stick numbers on every chair so we could contact trace. Just thinking about things as simple as putting down stickers, putting up signs. It takes days for that. Oh, wow. And so that part, just thinking through all of that, you know, there, there was just a lot of stress to all of that. And then when the kids came back, you know, we, we had them back. And at that, that year I was at young junior high and we had maybe 25% of our students back. It was a very small amount of students. We were just trying to, you know, have them here in the building and then help them turn assignments in and help them through the pandemic. Kids were sick. Their parents were sick. They were losing family members. It was really, it was a lot. So. We did the best we could having normal events. You know, we still were able to have sports and some activities, concerts and, you know, things like that. And I think that helped a lot. It, it also, though, 
led us to believe something normal was happening. And so when we returned to school last year in full regular school, we thought, okay, we should be fully normal. And we're kind of preparing for just some learning gaps. The kids who didn't come every day, they're just going to be behind in math. And we'll just work with some interventions like we always do and really, you know, hit the ground running with getting these kids on track. And then that's when we really were surprised. So it, it, the return from COVID last year was, well, one, we were still in COVID. There was still right the disease. We had people out. We still had to contact trace. We still had to send letters home. We still had to do all of the same protocols we did with 25% of our students. Now we're doing them with 100% of our students. Wow. Wow. And people were, you know, the, just, just going through all that, trying to figure out logistics again. And then what we, we saw was a lot of social and emotional needs of our kids. Our kids were really in bad shape. And, you know, looking back on it now, it's like, well, of course, if you just looked on Facebook, you know, grownups were in really bad shape. Everyone was in really bad shape. And we didn't think about that. And so they, they came back having a really, really hard time doing just the most basic commands, I guess, following the most basic commands. Like one of our rules was that you just can't have a hat on in the hallway. And that's due to a camera. There's a very, there's a, uh, reasonable reason for that. That's not just, Hey, cause we want to control you. It was because we have to see you on camera and it was that you can't wear it in the hallway, but you can put it back on in class. So really just about a four minute passing period is the only amount of time you couldn't wear that hat. And it was very interesting to watch kids response to when we would ask them to take their hat off. They would, they would have a very hard time with that about 50% of the students who wore hats, I would say, would respond in a way that we call unlike your same age peers. It is not the typical response of taking it off or just being annoyed with it, but a response of anger, shouting back, or having a kind of a tantrum, but a, a really big response to, to a seemingly easy command, take your hat off and you can put it back on in four minutes. So teachers dealt with that type of response to every seemingly simple command, you know, turn this in, stop talking, put your pencil down. A big one was put your phone up and we could not figure out what was going on. And when we would call a parent or someone to help with that, the parent would get upset, would also be just as angry. Why are you doing this? You know, and, and parents got upset with us quite a lot too. And so that was our year. And in the midst of it, we had a COVID surge. We had 25% of our staff off campus any day. So even when we were trying to work through some initiatives to help with that, I, you know, from one day to the next, I had 25% new staff. So we finally started to see a little bit of a difference after January. Um, the surge happened in January, February, we were kind of coming back off of COVID a little bit more. And then into March, what I remember about the end of March, what I remember is that February and March stayed the same. It was the first time, and I don't know how long, that we had one month go a particular way, not that it was perfect, and then another month after it went the same way. Yeah. And yeah, I, and I kind of remember that too, because I had COVID in December and in January, I got it again with a 10-day reprieve between. And it seemed like when I had it in December, not many people had it, but I did know some. But in January, it seemed like all of my friends in the Arlington area had it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, <clears throat> I guess the listeners need to understand that we're in the middle of the metroplex of Dallas-Fort Worth. And so if you're not familiar, you wouldn't know. We're not in a small town. We're in a very large city. And so it was rampant in January. And I felt that way. I finally was better by mid-February and had to fly out to speak somewhere. And so, but it was interesting. I flew, I spoke in Chicago 
that February, everything was shut down. Yeah. It was like, okay. But in March, it was like, wait a minute. I Do you hear? It's like, okay. Has it settled down a little bit? Mm-hmm. So what happened in March was finally the, with those two months in a row that had stayed consistent. So February and March, just having the, that consistency led us to be able to start planning ahead. And which is helpful for us, you know, as the school leaders. But I think what really came out of that, that was important was where we could finally see where our kids were. So why, why our kids were not going to quote, be, becoming back to quote normal. What we thought about was the fact that they hadn't had anything consistent for quite some time either. And for kids, they have to trust over and over and over. You have to really, really gain their trust. And they had worked really, really hard pre-COVID and then the world dropped from under them. And many of our kids who stayed home, stayed in homes that were not ideal. Um, What was going on in their lives, it was traumatic. And so over and over, they would say things like, you know, why should I turn this in? Or why should I do this? Or or even if they got in trouble or, or kind of acted up, they didn't care about the consequences because they thought they'd never see us again anyway, or, or eventually school just end. It, it was really interesting to watch their, the impact that the shutdown had on them. And so we started looking at that and we started telling them, you know, we're not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere. We are staying here. We're going to come back to school. We're going to keep coming back to school. We're going to keep having these expectations. And we had to do a lot of work with them. There was one point after, I think it was right after Christmas break, coming back uh, second semester, we sat down. I sat down with a little team here about the social skills that our students didn't have. And we talked about, you know, what we wanted them to do to volunteer or to work in groups or to, you know, be good partners or to help people when they need help. And I I remember having to talk to the committee of teachers about this and saying, Hey, we need to bring it down about 10 notches. That's a skill we would teach kids, you know, in a normal state. So we would normally teach kids those skills. And, and this year when they were going through, through that lack of trust again, I thought, you know, think of it in baby steps. So the baby step was, can you say hi to us? All we wanted was for the kids to say hi to us. And even then we had to take it back another step, which was, can you just say hi to us after we say hi first? So social skills for everyone, kids and adults were gone. They were on their phones all the time. They were Everything was virtual or online. They could turn off their screens. Mm -hmm. We ordered food online. I mean, you name it. Nobody had social skills. Even if if we went to McDonald's and ordered food, that person didn't engage with us like they normally would. So every experience that our kids were having, there were no, there was no social interaction. So we had to reteach how to say hi. And we did. We went through a whole initiative for that and and rewarded kids and gave donut parties. I mean, you name it to get them to just... Speak. I want you to tell I want you to tell the audience what you did because I thought that was really fun. The initiative? Yeah. So we had a poster. We came up with our criteria and it was look people in the eye, use a pleasant voice, and say hello. Those were the three things. So we had kind of like secret shoppers, and there would be <laughs> about 12 of us in the hallway with bingo dabbers. And at any non-disclosed passing period, we would stand in the hallway with our bingo dabbers and we would just say hi to kids as they walked by us. And if they said hi back, we got them on their hand with the bingo dabber. And it sounded so elementary. And even the committee, when they brought it up, I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder how this is going to go. But the kids loved it. And they were running to us and saying hi and smiling and and just all sort of things. And it really showed them, you know, they had a great time with it, but we did too on the receiving end. Then they would go to their class and the class with the most bingo dabbered hands uh, got a donut party. So we had a way that the teacher would, um, you know, share how many bingo dabbers they had. And we did that like four or five times and the kids really liked it and we did too. And it just started to really like show our kids, hey, this is, this is what we want. We want 
to connect with you and, and feel com- have you feel comfortable with us. So, but it was intentional, an intentional effort just to remind people how to say hi. And that's yes. where we were in January. In March, what we noticed, you know, coming back to school in January, the kids were a little bit better. Coming back to school after spring break, we saw a big difference. And the end of the year actually went really well, which usually it goes the opposite. Usually by the end of the year is when you kind of get more shenanigans. And then the return back to school this year has been has been really great. So I feel like the more we just keep coming back, every time we leave and come back and we're still here and we're still doing this, they trust us and they trust uh, the school again and, and we become the answer again. Consistency and intentionalness. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is that a word? Intentionalness. I, I think Being so. intentional. Right. It is for my purposes. May not be a Scrabble word, but hey, but being <laughs> intentional has always been one of my drives. Mm-hmm. We have to be, as a society, we have to be intentional now. And we need to pick up some kind of consistency again. And that's what you found out. Yeah. And I think it's okay to say, We can be intentional at a really basic level. I think sometimes we think intentionality has to be, you know, a big system or Mm -hmm. a new initiative. And, and what we did is we just went back to a very, very basic level and we all did it and, and it worked or it was a good first step. This year, a lot of, a lot of what we realize now, you know, after having been with kids for a year, after having been with society for a year now, the beginning of this year, which was, was part of the, uh, the open house state of, I think I called it the state of AHS, the state of Arlington High School. By that point, after a good year of looking at it, we could really see what had happened. And I, I spent a lot of the summer really, um, I listened to a lot of podcasts myself. And I thought that the issue last year was anxiety. I thought everybody just had so much anxiety and, and what is going on. And if I could just figure out how to work with anxiety, like at a school-wide level, that would be the answer. And after some work this summer, we, we took some classes with Sylvia Fuentes on trauma and toxic stress. And that's really what this had become. I, I don't think that hmm. we looked at the COVID era as trauma on everyone yeah and so different levels right some people went through trauma because they truly lost loved ones they watched it kids went through trauma because they were just home with their abusers a lot more than usual we went through trauma as an education system even down to you know the the waiter at chili's went through that trauma too yeah and it was just kind of this moment of realizing you know we all went through it. My teachers did, I did, my family did. And yet we were the ones who were supposed to be the answer for everyone else who went through it. And I think that's a lot of what happened last year is people thought, well, I'm going through all this. So let me just put, once my kids get back in school though, it'll all be back to normal because school will operate normally. And that will get them back to normal and they will heal my child. And we thought, yes, that's what we're supposed to do. And finally, at one point, we had to realize, oh, wait, we're not normal either. And so for everyone to collectively be going through it and not to have that person to lean on, I think, is what kind of put all of society in this in this place. But that's what I kind of talked to teachers about this year. And I think a, a lot of folks probably could relate with this idea that everybody went through trauma. And so when you go through trauma, your responses to situations are not as good as they would normally be. <laughs> and so you go through, you know, we've heard of fight or flight. And now it's fight or flight or freeze. And what I learned over the summer is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. You may even really try to be perfect and make every situation perfect and make this person feel as best they can. And in reality, you're going through a trauma response when you do that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we talked about is, is with teachers and kids. Everybody was treating every situation, every 
uncomfortable situation as if it was the most extreme. Well, and, and what what the effect of that is, is that, that you talked about the, the alumni gathering was the loss of all the teachers because they hit a wall. Yeah, it was the hardest thing they had ever gone through. And they were dealing with situations that were not in their control. And they felt powerless, demeaned. I mean, a lot of them, they just no energy. And like you said, the tox, toxic stress mm -hmm. just took their toll. And so you found yourself with a shortage of teachers. Yep. You know, just like every other industry, shortage of people, workforce, labor. I mean, it wasn't even just teachers, was it? You were probably short. It was everything. Yep. Yeah. It w cooks. We started, even this year, started with three cooks. We normally have 10. Security, bus drivers, uh, custodians, and then, of course, yeah, the education staff as well. So that part, you know, system-wide, even even principals and assistant principals, everybody was short. And and. That took some figuring out, too, as to why we were going through that. You know, there's always kind of been this thought about pay. You know, we don't pay educators enough. But these conditions that we've kind of heard people talk about in the past, that wasn't the case anymore. We've been dealing with those and still were able to have our schools staffed. This was very different. And we looked at, at teacher burnout heavily. And it was that a lot of those students and parents and anyone having those trauma responses of fighting or fleeing or freezing, freezing it took its toll on the teachers and on, on everyone. And so they left. They thought, I don't want to deal with that anymore. I'm not getting what I used to get out of being a teacher. And they left. So... This year, that's what we had to work on is how are we going to fill our school? And not only that, with educators who, you know, take on this, this giant, I guess, undertaking of, of fixing, of being the answer, of being the answer to whatever comes our way. So I looked at just helping them through kind of identifying burnout. And I talked to them about that, about these trauma responses. And I, and I do think this would tie to really any industry about, you know, you, when you're dealing with any, anyone in society, whether it's grownups or kids, they all went through this. And so all of their responses are, are less, I don't, they're just not as, as high performing as they once were everybody's down just one notch or two notches from what they usually are, or they were last year. And then additionally, in your industry, for me, it's education, but even in healthcare, in your industry, when you're working with your colleagues, they are all operating one to two notches lower than what you're used to. And so just right. collectively on you as one person, it just was hard. So we talked about it. Uh, I talk a lot of, to my teachers about just how to go go through that. And and one of the big outcomes that I came to with them is that we as an organization need to take responsibility for our teachers' burnout or for our staff's burnout. Last year, or even now, you'll hear people talk about self care, and I just hate hearing self care. It reminds me of adding another thing to your to do list, and then it's just another way that if you don't get to your self-care, it's just another thing you didn't get to. And so instead we talk about if you're feeling burned out, we need to know why, and then we need to figure out what's our role in it. And one thing about burnout is that you have to take it on at the organizational level, not at the individual level. And what we did all over COVID is we made every individual responsible for taking care of their own burnout. And there's no way that that's going to work. So yeah. as an organization, we take intentional steps on looking at where we're at as a whole. I have my staff take a little burnout test every six weeks. We're about due to take it again and see where you're at. And, and when you're at a certain point, that's when we need to figure out what we need to do collectively. We talked about working long hours and not saying you're not going to work long hours because you are. And so don't tell yourself you're not going to do something that's going to end up happening. And then you're just going to feel guilty about doing it, which is going to lead to your burnout. 
Instead, we say, what days of the week will you be working late? And stick to those days and the rest of the days you don't. Or for an administrator, what day of the week will you be leaving? Will you not be working late? And stick to that one day and and don't feel guilty about it. We talked about having mm. having a buddy, um, having, well, I call it the, a whirlpool man. So there's a story to that. I heard this little story about there was a woman who was sharing her childhood and her childhood was traumatizing. She had a traumatic experience. She lost her sibling when her sibling was three years old. And her parents, her mom and dad both couldn't, didn't handle it. They couldn't handle it well. It went really poorly. And her mom would have been, now we would know someone who would fawn during trauma and tried to act like everything was okay and still, you know, be on the PTA and still do all the things correct everywhere she went. But at home, mom and dad would fight a lot. So ultimately it led to a divorce and the daughter kind of went back and forth between the houses and just kind of lived that, that life. And when she was with her mom, who was a fawner, who would only show happiness, even though she had gone through trauma, she noticed that they, well, back in the day, if you had a washer and dryer and it went, it broke down, you would call the repair man. And so she called the whirlpool man and he came and repaired the washer one time when it broke down. And her mom sat with the whirlpool man afterward and talked to him for a long time about what was going on in her life. And that was it. Then he went on his way and and then she lived her life and then later would break the washing machine on purpose. <laughs> and then the whirlpool man would come back over. And they would sit and talk again and to the point where she would start making tea and they would sit at the table and <laughs> probably at some point the whirlpool man knew that the world, the washer was just getting hit with right. a hammer or something, you know, but, um, but he was there to talk to her and he still showed up and would always talk to her. And, and so I talked to my staff about that. I shared that story and I said, be someone's whirlpool man, um, and find your whirlpool man that helps you through those times too. Um, and those are the type of things that I, I feel like we all need. Everybody needs to, to have something that your organization does for you or talks to you about to help you through when, when you're go going through the burnout, which you will go through, and to help you get out of it. Yeah, I have lots of friends that when we went through the whole COVID thing and, and in the two-year time frame, we would do friend checks. And just call and check because as a consultant and a speaker, uh, March of 2020, everything canceled. And if it didn't cancel, you know, then it canceled in the summer and, and it got to be every time you had an upcoming conference that you were supposed to be speaking at, you had this waiting for the other shoe to fall, uh, heartache, and wondering how things were going to play. If they ended up being fine, you know, which I know now, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. huh, wait, wait, that was the year, right? Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> it was hindsight, but I know now that we made it through. But when it was all happening, you would just get this angst of, okay, what's next? What's going to cancel next? And what's going to happen next? And so we did several Several of us got together for Zoom calls. We would have happy hour Zoom calls. And we would just do friend checks. And I had lots of practices that told me that I, and I was so busting proud of the practices. The doc would have uh, Zoom calls with the staff during it. But mm -hmm. in what you're saying is interesting. You're continuing to do the buddy checks. You know, continuing to do the friend checks which I think, you know, we're kind of in a back to normal mentality, but we're not back to normal. And so maybe we need to continue to implement that. And, and I, actually, my friends, we kind of do do that pretty well. But within the practices and organizations like you're talking about, the burnout test, I wrote that down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the burnout test. It's just a quick, it's just a quick little 
you can get it on your phone and take answer about five questions and it kind of helps you send me the link to that i'll I'll post it in the in the show notes i will Um, i'll send it yeah so that'd be really good for them to be able to take advantage of and and to know because we have to care like you said you know the the output that we're producing is a, a couple of notches down than what we what we were pre covid and mm-hmm. and that's okay mm-hmm. it's okay i i will tell you that i get distracted more i have more things that i'm like oh i should do this and oh i should do that and really that should not have priority time slot <laughs> so yep. i should just cut that scratch that off and move on but yeah it's it's been interesting Mm-hmm. So that's part of what you're doing to retain. How did you find your teachers well, or your, your labors, whoever? Yeah. So we, we did a lot. I, um, and, and the district helped us a lot too, with a lot of job fairs. We've always had job fairs in AISD and then, and the ability to go to colleges and recruit and, and all of that. I remember last year at one point I was getting donuts for the faculty meet for a faculty meeting that morning. And I wear my badge everywhere. And there was a lady that asked if I was the principal and I said, yes, we got into a conversation and I pulled her in to be a substitute. So <laughs> things like that, like, and, That's and awesome. I, yeah. And I told my admin team, you know, wear your badge everywhere and, and let people start conversations with you based on that and, and talk to everyone about the potential to be a teacher. So, so if you've got someone who's willing to engage with you and, you know, who's in the service industry or who is, you know, has a great personality or who's interested in education, engage with them in conversation and, and pull them in. We have a great start to, to dabble your feet in education with substituting. And so we actually got a lot of folks just from kind of being out and about and, and meeting them. It, we were not past that at all. We did at our job fairs. What was different about last year hiring was the was to be in such heavy competition with ourselves. You mentioned this at the beginning, saying, you know, one school might be in competition with another school. And that is, you know, we've always kind of had people that choose Arlington High over school X. As they should. As As they they should. should. As they should. Yes. Yes. But we had situations where we knew these, you know, the person we were interviewing was interviewing at five other places as well that day. I mean, the, there was a, a very much, not only just trying to recruit people in for the interview, but to get them to choose us. And so it was important to us to know that, that, and for them to know that we knew that, that you have options and we know you choose us and that's important to us. We want you to choose us. It was already a big part, I think, of our culture. I feel that way about students and parents, too. I know you have options. Um, you, you bought your house to be in 013, and I know that, and I don't take that for granted. And so the same goes for employees. But we would do anything to stand out. I brought breakfast and tacos and coffee, and we brought swag, and you name it. Our booth, you know, we'd have a booth at different fairs, and our booth always had to look the biggest and the greenest. And I wanted people so to know that. So you were intentional. Intentional, very much. You we, were intentional. We created a job fair protocol. I Well, a project. I call everything a project now. And so we had a job fair project of all the different things we would do and who did what. We had walkie talkies. I mean, we were, wherever we were, we were getting people to our table first. It was it was that, or if we're out in public, we're talking about Arlington High, or if we're, um, once we get a candidate here and we know you're interviewing other places, regardless, you stay with us for an hour, we walk you through this building, we take you on a tour, we show you, we introduce you to different staff members. <laughs> we were doing a lot to stand out and, and get hired up, yeah, which we did. So did you, one of the things that I've recommended to um uh, other businesses and healthcare at the dental industry specifically is to ask their team members if they know anyone who's looking for a job or if they know someone who would be great working in the practice. Did you do that for your, your teachers? And yeah, definitely. So I would say that would be my number one place to go. If you have someone inside the organization vouching for you, that gives you many, many points. Right. 
And so, and so on the flip side of that is that I would expect also the organization to not vouch for just anyone. So sometimes we'll have a friend of a friend, you know, and they'll say, well, I told them I'd give you their name, but I'm not quite sure. So it goes both ways. Right. And that's really important. We do like external hires though, also just because it brings a a good amount of diversity to the campus in diverse perspectives and, and just a lot of, it just enriches kind of what we have. We want to see what the competitors are doing. So let's bring them in and they can work for us. And I think that's important too, but definitely we'd, we'd have, you know, everybody bringing anyone they knew and going out and talking to folks about, about the profession to kind of get them to be a part of it. And the big, the big takeaway from all of that is it's not business as usual. We're not going to find any employee, any labor, any worker the way we used to. Right. It isn't going to happen. Not not for a while. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get back to that because of everything that we've been through. There's a lot. But, and there's a lot of opportunity out there for other yeah. other fields that maybe, you know, you didn't know were available before. That's one thing with with some of the teachers who we lost. And, and I feel like my job is to, I say I like to help people find their happy place. I always ask people at interviews, what's your happy place? And it could be being a teacher. It could be being, I want to be an assistant principal or a principal one day, or I want to, who knows what. And, and I really take a lot of joy in helping people get to that happy place, whether it's here at Arlington High or whether it's, it's anywhere else. And last year, a lot of people decided, you know, they could have opportunities in a different field, maybe. And some were still on the fence. And what I told folks last year is, Last year was really hard, and I think last year was is the hardest year that we'll ever see in education or in any industry in our lifetime. Yeah. And, and so I know next year, which is the current 22-23 school year, I knew this year, though, would also be hard. So I told them, you know, even though 21-22 is going to be known as the hardest year ever in education, 22, 23 is not going to be a breeze. There's still lots of work to do. So if, if, you, if, if you're not ready for one more year of it, then, then you know, just give it a break and come back to me at 22, 20, or 23, 24. Because I really do think that those of us here still this year are the ones who are supposed to be here. I really think we... We are the ones who are, are ready to tackle it on. We're ready for one more year and we're ready to really repair and heal humans and humanity and education too. And if you just, if, if you're with us, you're one of them that are supposed to be here. But if this is a lot for you, just give me, come back next year and it's going to be, I think we're going to be great. Education will change. And that's one thing. It we has, do when we're, yeah. yep. And when we're hiring, we tell people that this I can tell you now what the job's going to be next year. Instead of telling you the job of 2019 and having you plan for a 2019, it's not going to be that. I know what it's going to be. And we can actually start recruiting and hiring for that skill set. Yeah. And that's, I think, what we're doing. That's a tough one. I mean, again, um, every market is fluid. Every market is evolving. Mm Mm-hmm into new standards, I guess, I guess, new challenges. I mean, some of those challenges still are in healthcare. And so, you know, if you go into a hospital or, or most medical offices now, they still have masks, at least in Texas. Mm-hmm. Once you get into a room, you don't have to have a mask. But any of the hallways and stuff, it's still masking. That's really different. That's got to play. So all the workers at the front desk, they're they're wearing masks. Now my dental offices, I don't know many of them that are masking. A lot of the veterinary practices, some of them are still masking. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the dynamic has completely changed, and so the more I think restrictive that environment is, the more stress it causes for the workers, uh, for the team members. And, and, you know, we have to have some kind of intentionality 
in helping them. Mm -hmm. We have to, instead of harping on them, help them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, being just being kind sometimes. I like the the whole idea of the the eye to eye contact and the smile. Um, I'm that person that always does that at the grocery store. I'm obnoxious. I want to make the <laughs> cashier <laughs> smile or laugh or something, and I want to include everybody. Oh my gosh! At the American Dental Association meeting a few weeks ago, we were just a, me and another colleague were walking down the street, and there was a gal kind of walking behind us. I just turned around and said, hey, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> just to, and the ends up, they were by themselves and they were dentists and they had come from out of town and we had a great time. We ended up chatting a lot the next couple of days. So she's my new BFF, I keep saying. So, but, but that kind of stuff, you know, that just makes a difference with where everyone has been. You know, what you're saying, Stacy, makes, I mean, it's so heartfelt. Again, mm-hmm. passionate. Well, and that, I feel like there are people who really want that human connection. They they want that a lot, but they're very awkward in having it because we're out of practice. And we think that we'll just be able to jump right in uh, to having conversations again, and they can't. And so sometimes when you're kind of forced into those conversations, it's actually... It actually creates a little bit of a safer environment. You don't feel as vulnerable just trying to start a conversation if you're not comfortable with it. So, you know, talking about that intentionality, you have to put those structures in place. And even though it makes things better to have face-to-face contact, people still, they still think they don't want it until they get it. And then they're like, okay, this went better. An example is even just having a, a conference. So we were able to have conferences online or just through email. People might email their concern and then I'd, you know, teacher or somebody would email them back and then they'd email back and forth. It was really easy to get feedback that way, but it was really hard to get to consensus that way. And what we started to feel was that people just wanted to kind of, um, I don't want to say win, but they just kind of wanted a battle. There was, there was this time where everybody was ready for a fight and they would say, I'm mad at this or you know this is ridiculous and and i call it the speak to the manager era everybody wants to speak to the manager um nobody wants to speak to the person you know we would say well let's talk about it let's talk about it we want to grow and learn let's talk about it and come to a resolution and they didn't want the resolution they just wanted somebody to get in trouble and that was just a and it's not gone away i shouldn't even talk about it in past tense it's not gone away It's it's, alive and well in the presence of Google reviews and mm -hmm. Yelp reviews. And, 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 you know, even those reviews, you could go to that manager and a lot of times they'd say, if you would come and talk to me, right. I would fix it. There's something, there's something going on where there's a, there's a payoff. Yeah. When I don't seek resolution and that is not the business as we know it, we're used to resolving issues. So this kindness, to me, that's kindness coming in and talking it through and getting and everybody leaves happier, but it is harder. Yeah. Um, and so we create those structures. And you know, some of these things are non negotiables, so you have to come in and we have to have a face to face meeting. And if you can't come in at this time, we'll come in at a new time. And we, we push people to have to talk face to face with us. To and at the end of the day, it. it goes better. But it's, it's harder. Okay, one other thing, because we're at the one hour, I cannot believe you and I could probably talk for hours. For sure. But but one of the things that we talked about before we started recording, I want to go through because it, no industry should just stop learning. No industry should just say, I know everything, so I don't need to do anything. And Mm -hmm. since I'm a conference speaker, that's really important for me to to point out that we have to continue learning. We have to continue to be reminded of certain foundational information. But you had a really unique opportunity that you were telling me about. My nephew, who's an associate dean at a college here, has had similar, and that's what I was going to tell you, Mm -hmm. Stacey. He's done the similar things. But tell us about what you did. Uh, was it last weekend or weekend before last? 
Well, are you talking about Harvard? Harvard, yeah. So it was actually over you know, the not summer. To, not to throw names. Right. The, but I, I may or may not drop that name every now and again now. I've got some <laughs> Harvard gear. Um, so it, it's called the Public Education Leadership Project. So it's been going on for, for many years. So Harvard has this, you know, a, a whole unit basically in their business, a school of business where they bring in businesses or now schools and leadership and they, and we get to take courses um, from actually, actually on the business end from business professors about how businesses run and, and then connect that to how, you know, the school system runs. So Arlington, you have to apply. We applied and it was our superintendent, Dr. Cavazos, our chief of schools, our chief academic officer, our superintendent of accountability and testing. And then I got to go to represent principals and uh, one other principal, Cindy Brown, who's the principal at an elementary school in Arlington. So we got to go for a week and stay in dorms and just get a lot of really great sessions and have the whole Harvard experience. By the end of it, we came up with a big project for our district and it aligns to our strategic plan. And it's just kind of, we called it the vision for learning, what we're trying to do for kids and how we want to, you know, roll out a lot of our initiatives. What's interesting is that just from that, we, we met again actually today, um, we are in a triad because it's schools from our districts from around the country. So we're in a triad with Omaha Public Schools and St. Louis Public Schools. And we met today to talk through our project work. And it's interesting, we're all three in the same place, which is that the summer work we thought, uh, what we thought we were going to come back to this year, we didn't. And so our work has changed and, and just to evolve and adjust. So talking about, you know, constantly learning and growing, we went to a session that we learned a lot about and then come back and have to evolve again. And that's really what a lot of that coursework was about. It was about not uh, looking at other people's practices in the in other industries, but really what they all had in common was just being innovative, being growth minded, taking on the the problem of the day, seeking out other people's perspectives and looking at how other people had solved those problems and then, you know, trying to use all of that in in kind of creating their own their own path. So it was a great, really neat experience. There was no business as usual mindset, right? No business as usual. And you know, it's, it's the irony of it is Harvard, which is a very traditional school. So like the pulpit, uh, the, the, the setting of those classes is very traditional, but the material that you learn in that very traditional setting is very innovative and very forward thinking. Wow. See, and that's what I try to get across to the audiences when I speak. We can't just assume that we're going to go back to 2019. It's not going to be the same. So right. what we learned to do back then, some of it as far as skill may still apply, but we have to be in a little bit better shape and we have to change some things that we did because we found out in 2020 it didn't work so well. And so we have to evolve in our business practices as well as our mindset in helping our employees grow, making sure I liked what you said about the, the making sure that they're in the right job and that they're getting the right training for that job, um, that you're allowing them to be the best person that they can be uh, in that position. So in supporting them too, that's the best part because you're the leader of Arlington High. I mean, that kind of falls yeah. on your shoulders. And yet you fall, have to follow, Stacy. I'll just remind you, you have to follow <laughs> what comes out of your mouth too, you know, as far yeah. as making sure that you're taking care of yourself. And I didn't use this, the self tear. I just turned it around. <laughs> but to, to make sure that you're taking care of yourself as well. Because I know a long time ago, I learned while I was taking care of my parents, if I wasn't taking care of me first, then I could not take care of them. I was not able to take care of them the yep. way that they needed it. So that's kind of held through. Um, wow, this was a ton of information. And so 
Oh my gosh, Stacy! Any <laughs> last thoughts that you want to get across or say? Oh, you know, I just think that in in you know in in the the healthcare industry and with us as well. I just I really do see these parallels, and I and I know the hardship that we've all kind of gone through, and I I go always come back to, um, and really at any moment in time, I come back to we are the ones who are supposed to be here. And so now during the last three years of, of this pandemic that nobody knew what was going on, restructuring all of society, and then now rebuilding after, you know, afterward, the aftermath, we're the ones who are supposed to be here. Whatever profession we're in, we're, the, we are, we're here for a reason. And what a compliment and what an honor that is to to be the ones here during this time because we're the ones who have the skill set and have what it takes to get to get humanity through this so you know i i feel like anytime folks feel down and out about it just remember you know you're you're the one you are here you have something in you that's supposed to supposed to be a part of this right now and it's very important my dad used to say you're either part of the solution or you're a part of the problem I was raised on that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to be part of the problem. Right. I want to be part of the solution. And I've always, I mean, there were times, even when I was at Arlington High, that I might have been a part of the problem. <laughs> but, but, you know, when you grow up a little bit, you decide you want to be part of the solution. And he really ingrained that in us. I will say, first of all, thank you, Stacy, so much. Um, you have a busy schedule, and I really appreciate you taking the time out to share all this valuable information. Of this course. was amazing. Thank you I for mean, having this me. This was amazing. <laughs> I, I, in fact, had said I wasn't going to bring this up, but I will tell you just in light of some of the things that we said. Um, I actually, a few weeks ago, had to be hospitalized for pneumonia. That's That's a kind of a big, fat, hairy deal that I haven't told a whole lot of people. Uh, but I had respiratory failure one evening after coming back from speaking at the American Dental Association meeting. Ended up it was bacterial pneumonia. Not sure where I got it, where I picked it up, how I got picked it up. Don't know if I got it in Houston. Don't know if I got it in a gas station on the way home. Who knows? This is not house. This is not an episode of house. And trust me, I'm so analytical. I've tried to figure it out. But I will tell you, while I was hospitalized, I'm freaked out. Um, they, I, one of the things that I notice is they are very shorthanded at the hospital. The night nurses are short, the hospitalist doctors, um, they're not, they're not enough to cover the floors. And yet I got quality care. They made it happen. I knew that they were short and I decided when I went in that I was going to be the best patient that they could have. I'm freaked out, but I, I'm not stupid. I do know that if you're nice and you're kind um, and you say please and you say thank you every time somebody comes in the room, they smile. I had nurses that were surprised. I said please and thank you. I said thank you to the people that brought my food in. And they just, I mean, one of them turned around and said, you're welcome. I mean, a surprise. You're welcome. And it was like I, simple things. Simple, basic, common courtesy that we forget to our wait staff, um, to anybody, just to say please and thank you. Just to let you know, I am perfectly fine now. Well, I'm not perfectly. I'm still recovering, <laughs> but I'm good. I'm really good. I am way out of crisis. The doctor said, told me this last week, um, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Actually, she said a race, to which I responded. You do know a marathon's a race, right? <laughs> but she knows I'm smart, Alec. Um, but I just wanted to tell you because they were all surprised. I got to share with them um, some of the things that I talk about in my ethics courses. I mean, it was, I had some really interesting conversations with uh, charge nurses and discharge nurses and respiratory therapists who are thinking about leaving the profession 
three of them at various times for whatever reason chose me to talk to me about they were burned out. Mm -hmm. And so Stacy, man, this is relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were all done because unfortunately not all their patients said please and thank you. (laughs) Yeah. So I just will say I, you, you listeners, please be patient with people. As Stacy very eloquently pointed out, everyone's a little bit, no, a couple of notches down from their optimal right now, and we're still ramping up. This was such a great episode. Be sure you subscribe to our to be notified of any new releases. But this one, this one's gonna gonna make the hits. I know. My next planned episode is another In the Embezzlement News with Janice Jansen, so stay tuned. And just a reminder, just to circle back to that again, remember, somebody needs you to lead with integrity. Somebody needs you to lead with intentionality. Your family, a coworker, a friend, commit to being the very best version of yourself always, even when you're in the hospital. Just commit to be that very best version of yourself because somebody is watching. Someone needs that. And always lead with integrity in all things. Until next time, take care. That's a wrap for this podcast of Money In, Money Out. Thanks for listening. Be sure to write down the most valuable tip you learned today so you don't forget it. And remember, you can find out more about all the valuable books and services Susan has to offer at www.susangunsolutions.com.